This, this is a mikvah. Uh, plural of mikvah, mikvaot, add an OT to the end of it. So if you hear the word mikvaot, you're talking about more than one mikvah. We're Americans, we say mikvahs, okay? That's the way it works. But this is where they would go, the Essenes would go to ritually cleanse themselves. Now, the Jews would typically ritually cleanse themselves before they do anything sacred. If they're going to do a sacrifice on the Temple Mount, if they're going to take a vow on the Temple Mount, if they're going to end a vow, because people would take vows and they would end them. If they're going to enter into a covenant, they're going to get betrothed or something like that. They would always go to where there was a mikvah. Typically, they're all around the Temple Mount. Tomorrow, when you're in Jerusalem and we're in some of the excavations there, the, the, there's mikvahot all over the place. I mean, the big ones, little ones, four-sided ones, some that are, you know, five steps and some that are even, long, you know, ten steps. But seven was usually the perfect number for going down into a mikvah. Mikvahs were lined with plaster, as Ronnie was saying over here. You can see some of the plaster left because this one was constructed out of rock that was put together and then lined with plaster. The ones in Jerusalem are usually carved out of bedrock and then lined with plaster so that they don't leak. They're filled with, and you guys remember this from the other day, from yesterday, living water. Living a day before yesterday, my goodness, things go by quickly. Filled with living water. And it was a lot of water. How do you get living water in a place like this? Rainwater counts because it's fresh water. It's moving. It's, 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 again, it's not drawn from a well. So they would put the water in there. Now, here was the procedure with a mikvah. You're going to go do a sacrifice, let's say, or in the case of the Essenes, maybe they're going to write the name of God, Yahweh. And they're not going to do that lightly. They all would go and cleanse themselves before they would write certain things down as they are scribing the, the scriptures that they scribe. And so the way you would do this is that the water would be down there. You would come up to the mikvah, and this whole facility was men. So they would, forgive me, I'm going to be very blunt here, but you would strip down naked, and then you would step down into the water. Now, you don't get a bar of soap and a brush and start scrubbing. That's not the way you ritually cleanse yourselves. But what you would do is you'd have the water that would be maybe up to your waist, maybe. And then you would scrunch down until all your hair was underwater. That was the rule. Now, this isn't in the Bible. There is a time of cleansing in the Bible that Moses talks about over in Exodus 33. But it's not the same sort of thing, kind of. That's where they got it from. If you're wondering where they got it, it's Exodus 33. It's in there. But then they developed it into this, this typical ritual that goes way beyond the confines of the Word of God. But they get their hair all wet, completely submerged, so they're scrunched down into this fetal position, and then they stand back up again, they step out, they dry off, and now they're ready to do whatever it is that was sacred. Now, that was the procedure. Here was the meaning behind it. And this is an eye-opener if you're paying attention to it. What the Jews have always believed we think it's a New Testament concept. It's the Bible. That man, ever since Adam, every person since, is born with a sinful nature. Conceived in sin, as David put it. Not that conception is sinful, it's not, but that every person that has ever been conceived has inherited their sinful nature from Adam. We are sinners. And you can always tell how sinful people can be at a very early age. Those of you who have had children, you remember when they're born, they're so cute. They're so fun to be around. Yeah, change the dieties, but oh man, they're fun. And then they start to learn how to talk. And what are their first words? Mama, Papa, and? No, yeah, you already got there before me or mine, <laughs> right? The sinful nature emerges early. Now, there is one time in a person's life, the Jews have also believed, where a person has a sinful nature, but is absolutely incapable of sinning. And that's when you're in the water of your mother's womb. Now, here's how the mikvah works. You would express to God, I want to be as pure as the day before I was born when I'm about to do the sacred thing and so you would strip down naked you would go down into the water which represented the water of your mother's womb you scrunch down into a fetal position until all your hair is covered 
you stand up, you step out of the ritual bath, and the moment your foot leaves the water, they had an expression for you. They said you were born again. Born again was not a riddle that Jesus was playing with Nicodemus. Nicodemus had a problem, and he came to Jesus at night because he did, of course, he was you know, afraid of the peer pressure of the other guys and what might happen with that. But Nicodemus wasn't astonished when Jesus said, you must be born again. How can a man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? What are you talking about? No, that was a legitimate question. How can I really lose my sin? Because Nicodemus had come to the conclusion that doing all the rituals, doing all the ceremonies, none of it takes away my sins. He was a very smart man, he's a very righteous man, he's a very good man, and he's being very honest. How does this really work? And when Jesus says you must be born again, he's astonished by that, but then he also, Jesus begins to talk about now the serpent on the pole, remember? And that whole thing, when you gaze upon that and you're healed, when the, back in the times of Moses, and how Jesus is like the serpent on the pole, he completely changes the direction of it. Being born again was nothing that, was something that, that Nicodemus knew all about. It was represented by this ritual. And now you know which is where our baptism came from. When you think about being baptized, denominations have divided on this all over the place, where they say, how should we be baptized? Should it be forward? Should it be backward? Should it be sprinkling? Should it be a cup over your head? What should it be? In those days, baptism was started with this. This is its origin. And you would do it by yourself. You would have a witness, a rabbi or somebody witnessing what you're doing. Who would that be? John the Baptist. And people would come to him. They would step into the Jordan River, which was also considered a mikvah because it's living water. It has water that's flowing. So that's considered pure water. And then they would scrunch down, not naked. That would be a bad thing publicly because it's a very public thing, but they would scrunch down into the water and come back up on their own. John the Baptist didn't plunge them. They might do it as many as three times. We say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They would do it three times for other reasons, but they would dunk themselves that way. That's how baptism originated. And so when we get baptized, we're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because it can also speak of death and coming to life again or death and being born again, but don't confuse that with reincarnation because the Bible deplores that because there were people that believed in it and even in the New Testament the Greeks also believed in reincarnation at least some of them did but the Bible never talks about that the Bible plays it straight but this is where born again came from so when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus he's talking to Nicodemus right where Nicodemus knows what he's talking about that's the way Jesus spoke to people remember he wants to be understood. He wants his message to be clear. He's not going to say things that are deliberately there to perplex the mind and say, look how smart God is. God is infinitely smart, infinitely knowledgeable, and he wants to be understood. So when Jesus says anything like that, we go, ooh, I wonder what that really means. And if you say the expression and afterwards you say, what does that mean? And you go, uh, that one word answer. Realize you're looking at an idiom, find out what it really means, and the meaning explodes right out of the Bible. All right, so now you know about born again. Let's go over to cave four and have a look at where the Bible was found.